All right, wait. why don't we go ahead and get started? Look, we've got a pretty full house here, and so thank you all for coming. Um, just, from a, just from a logistics standpoint, uh, thank you all for coming to the summit, right? This is, this is the last of the workshops. I don't think there's anything scheduled after this in any of the tracks, so I think you thank you all for staying to the, you know, all the way through. Uh, we've got a good one here uh, to wrap it up. Um, Again, logistically, I think a bunch of these will be online, right? And so we've had it professionally recorded. So, you know, you'll be able to get access to this. But if you still want to take photos of the people or the slides, that's fine too. But it will be available online afterwards, right? Um, I think also usually through the summit, we do a bunch of uh, surveys or kind of feedback. Uh, please, please be proactive. You know, we'd love to hear that. So please uh, provide that as well. So, um, so with that, let me introduce uh, the Facebook team here. We're going to go over, uh, who's going to go over different aspects of our 100G optics and some of the new developments uh, that, we're, that they've been working on and they've, they've been sharing with the community. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, my name's Catherine Schmidtke. I do optical technology strategy at Facebook. And I'm very proud to have up with me today um, this is the 100 Gig Optics core team. Uh, so we have uh, Reza, you can read the names, Reza, Abhijit, Vincent, and Kathy. And we're going to be telling you about uh, 100 Gig Optics and what it took to, to deploy this. Okay, click the L. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to click a bunch of things until something... Okay, that worked. It's directional. So, first of all, a little bit about the application where we're using 100 gig optics. And we've talked about our switch fabric in a number of different forums. In fact, there's a blog post that talks about it here at the bottom that you're welcome to go and get some more information about it there. Uh, so, this is what it looks like in practice. This is a view down one of the aisles in our data center, and you can see different colored optics though, there. Those are, that's an older data center, that's multi-mode optics. We're going to be talking about the new stuff coming up here. But it, it does give you an idea of what's inside the data center. On the right-hand side, this is one of the uh, floor plan layouts of the fabric architecture and the colored lines in that diagram represent optical fiber. So that's the connections between the switches in our network. Okay, so I showed that picture with multi-mode fiber, but we've been deploying single-mode fiber for quite some time now. And we did that for a number of reasons. Primarily, it's to do with um, installation and how easy it is to install that and the cost associated with installing fiber. So um, single-mode fiber is cheaper than multi-mode fiber and we're using duplex single-mode fiber, so it's fewer strands. It's a, at least four times fewer strands of fiber. So that's actually a big difference when you think about how large your data center is and how much fiber you're deploying. Also, with multi-mode, every time we change the data rate, we'd have to change the fiber out, starting with OM2 and then OM3. And then when we looked at 100 gig, we were looking at OM4. And it's not that much fun changing fiber out all the time. It's, uh, the buildings are very large, and the fiber is installed as part of the building. So we wanted a solution that would be future-proof as we went to new generations and something that could be depreciated over multiple cycles. So this is what we decided to deploy. This is based on CWDM4. The form factor at the top right, many of you will recognize this. This is QSFP28. It's ubiquitous out in the industry. There are very many different optical transceivers that fit inside this form factor, very different um, PMDs or um, physical media. So we used uh, a single mode duplex fiber in and out of that QSFP28. And we chose to use CWDM4. 
So CWDM4 has four wavelengths that are separated at 20 nanometers, so that allowed us some advantage um, to use technologies that didn't require cooling. So it's a wider spacing than DWDM. And then we tailored the specification for our own particular environment inside a data center. And that's a little bit different to what uh, other end users use. For example, the telecommunications industry has some pretty stringent requirements on the reach, the temperature, and the lifetime. And so we tailored those specifications for a data center environment. And this is what I'm sharing here. Uh, so the reach, instead of two kilometers, which was part of the MSA, inside our data center, the longest link that we could possibly think of was 500 meters, so we're actually well below that. So we've um, defined the link loss appropriate for that distance and appropriate for the number of connectors that we have in the link. And then the operating case temperature is also reduced because the data center is an environment that we control very well. We specify everything that goes into that data center. We know what the ambient temperature is going to be. And so we're able to control the case temperature of the optic. Instead of 0 to 70, we can control it to 15 to 55 degrees C. That's about half the temperature range. And for those of you who have studied optics, you will know that most of the specifications are temperature dependent. And if you can reduce that range, it makes um, the solution much simpler. So here, this is the CWDM4 OCP. And so once we'd worked out what worked for the data center environment, this is part, we're part of OCP, and we want to share back with the community. And so we're here explaining what it was that we used and we've submitted that for approval as part of the networking group of OCP. It was submitted January the 9th, and you can go and look at the specification that we submitted. And we're going to be talking a little bit now about what happened in practice and how we actually deployed that. So Reza, come on up. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so as early adopters of a new technology, there's a lot of added risk. Now tie that into all the dependencies that goes to bringing up a data center, and you have a very big, challenging uh, problem. Um, and over the last year and a half, this team, we've been working together to address that on the optical side. And it's real. We've actually deployed our first 100 gig uh, data center in Altoona, Iowa. And this has been deployed successfully and is running 100 gig optics right now end to end. Um, so there's a lot of various parameters that go into there, a lot of moving parts. On one hand, you have the technical requirements and qualifications on the optic side. On the other hand, you have to deal with the logistics, the supplies, bringing a brand new technology up, training the data center techs to handle that, and specifically aligning up your data center bring up, which is driven by Facebook's demand, versus a technology bring up, which is driven by qualifications and uh, everything else. So in order to do that, we need to do a very good job in terms of our qualification. Um, so how do we qualify? Uh, we go through a lot of various stages. We start from a uh, component module level. Uh, we eventually will progress down to a system level sort of tests, and then we'll go to data center level tests. And as we go from stage to stage, the blast radius of failure at each stage grows. Right? For example, if your data center, uh, if we're doing data center testing and we have failures in the data center at that point, that can have significant impact. Whereas if we catch everything else in component and module level testing, um, we end up becoming uh, much more uh, safe in terms of uh, the damage that that can have. Um, so with that, it's very important to have very data-driven uh, progressions through each stage. Um, to talk a little bit more into the detail of our actual qualification process, here's Abhijit. Thank you, Reza. So as Reza mentioned, like uh, <clears throat> we started this uh, 100G CWDM4 at the uh, infant stage. Uh, and that time I remember like it was a uh, few vendors, all the vendors were struggling with their design. So basically I still remember uh, there was one vendor who told me like, I'll give you half part. I, I was a little bit shocked. So I, what is half part? So basically it was like only two channels were working and not even with the room temperature. So we started the started our journey uh, from that stage. Uh, 
So most of the part, uh, how, how we uh, developed our test methodology. So in the first block, as you see, it's the product feed. At, as Catherine mentioned, like we did a lot of uh, MSA spec modification, like temperature, the link budget. So basically, we understood this, all these spec at that stage. And once we uh, understood the uh, spec properly, we wanted to do the design and verification stage. So basically, it was like the starting was trust but verify, but we had to go beyond that. So basically, we did a lot of uh, verification, the validation testing at the Facebook, and we gave all our feedback to all the vendors so that they can do their design uh, based on our feedback, and they can move fast. Uh, once we had that design verification done, uh, it is always to find out the pr uh, product robustness which we qualify at the qualification stage uh, based on all the industry standard qualification. And uh, the most important part is the uh, production test with, at a large scale. So basically, we need to find out the product, what we have now, can it survive at our data center environment? So we, it's a large scale we deploy uh, as a pilot run, you can call it. So we do that, and we run the control traffic to find out what's the beat error rate, what's the packet error rate, how many packets we send. So all these kind of validation we perform at the production test. And now ability to scale manufacturing because this is a, a very new technology and I think Facebook is one of the uh, first few companies who are deploying this uh, CWDM for technology. So basically we are going through a lot of uh, iteration at this point and early failure modes. Uh, let me don't have something? OK. So basically, uh, these are some of the examples I try to give here, uh, which uh, we are seeing at this point. Uh, as you see on the right side of the picture, uh, CWDM4 wavelength, as Catherine mentioned, we have 20 nanometer gap uh, between each channel. But as you see, the first channel is showing two peaks, which is failing for the SMS. So these kind of issues we are seeing, and we, we are uh, working closely with all of our vendors and trying to help them how, how they can uh, reduce these kind of issues and we can run our data center smoothly. So next, I think, uh, from the quality standpoint, Vincent will go over in details. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abhiji. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Winston Zeng. I'm working on the MQE uh, Stanford Manufacturing Quality Engineer at ASOE Group uh, at Facebook. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit uh, about the, uh, the quality control for the supplier uh, qualification process at Facebook. We have it. Uh, the one thing I would like to share with you is that the risk. Um, the risk management for the product is actually is our first priority. Uh, so um, we, we want to make sure that um, the failures at our data center, which is massive compared with the, uh, the any failure at the supplier's the manufacturing side. So we want to make sure that um, our consolidated quality plan is in place ahead of time. And then, so that is why we developed some of the process which we want to share with the uh, OCP community today. Um, this is some of the examples I want to share with uh, with the community. So one is about the flexibility uh, versus the long-term reliability. And then I think Catherine and the app also mentioned about that um, a little bit. Uh, you know, on this uh, Tecordia standard, which require long reliability testing, like a normally like, like a 2,000 hours of reliability testing. But if we follow standard process, we may delay our deployment. So what we took it actually is a little bit uh, challenge. We want to engage with the supplier uh, more as, as, or, or as early as quick as possible that we can understand the failure mode in the earlier stages so we can kick off our qualification process inside of Facebook earlier before the 2,000 hours, for instance, like some of the reliability testing started. So this is one of the things we, we started. Actually, this is uh, very successful in, our, in this program. 
Second one, we want to synchronization between the supplier's quality control plan versus our control plan. Um, you know, every supplier have their different opinions because of the different design. So we want to sync up in the day one, first day one, when we selected their technology. So that is actually help us to communicate, ha have a better communications between us and our supplier. Whenever the issue come out, um, on the, on, we can uh, address the problem easily. So last one is about the feed, uh, feed rate and the DPPM, uh, the prediction versus uh, the actual number. The way we're looking at this one is very seriously because we want to use this one to gauge the supplier's uh, uh, research of uh, the design and the operational capability. Uh, for instance, like uh, for this one, uh, this uh, uh, 100 gig set of DM, they don't have any actual feed rate or DPPM data, but we want to use their old, you know, the product's data to gauge uh, their capability. So that is one thing we want to do. And then last one is that um, uh, we working with our supplier to engage on the very detailed process of the development and then to make sure that the process is solid in their production floor as well as the testing is solid. So we want to, the only thing we want to do is that we want to make sure that all the failure is keep in their uh, manufacturing site. So which in, in other words, we want to keep uh, this, uh, you know, the uh, no factory escape. And this is uh, one of the examples uh, on, the, on the flow chart is one of the example is showing that the, the way we work in our supplier, we get the very good yield uh, improvement and also steady on the, uh, we call the, um, the transmitter optical subassembly of the, the modules. So the red one you can see uh, before we engage uh, and then to get uh, this, uh, you know, the uh, extra testing script, uh, the process you can see the yield is very low, and then after that, you can get a very high yield and then very steady. So that is the way we want to work with our supplier in that details. And after that, after the mass production, we want to have, uh, you know, the, we call it ongoing reliability testing on the supplier side. By doing that, we can monitor the quality performance as well as the reliability at a statistic, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the level. That is the way we can control any of the quality event uh, if possible, inside the data center in the future. Okay. So I have a last one. Okay. <laughs> um, so for this slide, I want to talking about one thing. Um, uh, you know they. Uh, they, we understand that there's no, uh, uh, no product that uh, has no defects um, um, in eventually. So it, they always have a defects and always has a failures in the real applications. So how we can gauge this, uh, um, how can we manage the failures in the field? Actually, that is what we think is the last gate for the, uh, the successful for the product. So what I'm trying to show you here is the service model of the supplier actually is very critical to us. Um, Facebook doesn't, uh, uh, don't fear about the failure at our uh, real application field. But we really feel is that we fail, we don't know why, and uh, there's no action from our supply side. So that is what we're talking about, the um, RMA process, wi which means uh, return materials authority as well as a failure analysis. Um, that is a critical, and that is the one thing we always try to work with our supply to improve that area. And another thing I want to talk about here is that uh, we call it the risk assessment. So for instance, you have some failures in our data center, and then actually we don't care about uh, how many units fail in the sense of if the failure rate is uh, below like 1.0%, but we really care about it behind, which means on 99% of the unit, whether it's uh, secure or whether it's uh, safe. So that is I call it the risk assessment. So that is uh, why we're looking at the failure analysis uh, in that serious level, okay. Uh, so next time, uh, uh, next one, I want to have uh, Cassie to talk uh, talking about the ecosystem. Is it working? No, no, no. That was Omar. That wasn't me. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kathy Dill, and I am on the sourcing team for Network Hardware. And uh, what we really wanted to show with this slide is that. The we have a whole ecosystem. It's not, you know, that the optics are integrated with and all of this is qualified. 
and works together. So we have our top of rack switch, we have our fabric switches, which can be uh, backpack, which was displayed today at our booth. There was a talk this morning on both backpack and our top of rack switch. And then we also have OEM gear that we use, and then of course the optics. So it's a whole ecosystem, it's all qualified and it all works together. And it's all commercially available, which is this slide. So we wanted to share with you uh, how you can procure these items. So with the optics, we have two suppliers that we're sharing today, which is Colorchip and Finisar. And those are the part numbers. And over on the switch side, uh, as I mentioned, you saw at our booth, I'm sure, we have the topper rack switch, Wedge 100, and our fabric switch, which we're calling Backpack. And those are the suppliers and part numbers for those items as well. And so, in conclusion, what we really wanted to make sure uh, the community knew is that we have deployed 100 gig, it's in production, it's running, it's doing great, and we're sharing all of this with OCP from the spec, as Catherine mentioned, for the optics, to the switches that uh, Jiping and uh, Xu presented this morning in their workshop. Uh, it's all commercially available. And that's our conclusion, so we're open for questions now, right, Omar? Any questions for the panel? We've got, uh, we've got even, anyone, uh, oh, got it here in the back. <coughs> hey guys, <clears throat> can you guys talk about the cost delta between the two kilometer CWDM4 <coughs> and the 500 meter CWDM4? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> can you guys talk about the cost difference or <laughs> the cost question. <laughs> um, that's really not something that we can talk about in this forum. Um, I can say that it was significant enough for us to go and do this work, yes? So if it wasn't significant, we wouldn't have done that. But I think it's not appropriate to give numbers in this forum. Okay. Thanks very much for sharing this with us. Can you comment on the Facebook data center interconnection, uh, the speeds, the types of fiber, et cetera? Uh, yes, I think we covered uh, some of that. And there's a, a blog post, which of course is a very long string, hard to write down, but be happy to share that with you. Uh, so this is all available um, in a number of blog posts. Our fabric uh, switch architecture uses single mode fiber, duplex fiber, CWDM4 optics. Uh, we've been very open sharing that. I got two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, why don't you uh, consider the usage of uh, different kind of uh, fiber transceiver? For, for example, the show reach one, and the LR that goes to up to t uh, 10 kilometers, the first question. Yes. The second one is, uh, what should we do? I, I'm from Delta, they're trying to make fiber transceiver. What, what, whom should I contact with if we want our transceiver to be qualified by you? <laughs> well, I guess the, the second part of that question is kind of obvious given who's all set up here, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, the first part of your question about, uh, sorry guys, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> um, the different type of transceivers. So uh, this has been about switch in interconnect inside our data center. Obviously, we have uh, um, applications outside of the data center that have different optics on them. So we haven't talked about that today. Um, you asked about multi-mode. Uh, yeah, so 10 kilometer is too long for inside our data center, so that's outside. And multi-mode, uh, we used to do multi-mode at lower data rates, but for the reasons we said here, single mode fiber allows us future proofing. Oh, thank you for your talk. Uh, what do you use for the top of the rack to the server? Um, do you use any copper or do you use multi-mode? I assume you're not using CWDM4, right? Sh sure. Uh, the top of rack to servers uh, depends on uh, what NIC you end up using, whether it's uh, yeah. 10 gig, 25 gig, 50 gig. Uh, you've seen some of the servers right. that are displayed. Right now, it's all uh, DAC cables. Okay. Um, as we go to higher speeds and we need longer reaches, we might start uh, 
having to look at opticals, um, that would probably be AOCs as uh, C yeah. CWDM would be far okay. too expensive. So AOC uh, configure as a breakout then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks for uh, sharing your experiences deploying 100 gig and getting it going. I'm sure it was a lot of late nights. Um, my question is, you've tailored the optical specifications of these modules specific for your use case, and yet the industry is kind of going and developing these things many years in advance in forums like IEEE. Can you comment on how you would like to see the industry respond and um, how, how we can do things differently to make sure that we're heading in the same direction earlier? Great question. <laughs> I, Apogee has a t-shirt for you. No. <laughs> no, that this is uh, something that um, we worry about. Uh, so there's a lot of talk in the industry about fragmentation and breaking out into very many different form factors, different PMDs. Uh, so um, that's why we're here, uh, sharing about what works for us. I think that our application, our use case, is in common with very many of the hyperscale, web scale, you know, they have different names, um, th those types of end users. And we're doing what we can to, to share and to um, help the industry move to alignment. For someone who has been uh, involved in both IEEE and some of the MSA, um, uh, actually the IEEE does not get involved in the temperature and some of the you know, um, mechanical aspects. So I think what you have done is like uh, you've taken the CWDM4 and for your requirement, you have reduced the operating temperature. But it, you're still using the CWDM4. I mean, you could argue back uh, in 2000, when was it that? Maybe 2005 or 2006, um, Maybe the I in IEEE we choose the wrong, uh, you know, wavelength grid. But at the time, I think the primary application was uh, 10 kilometer, and because it was mostly for the router <coughs> application to to some of the DWDM, you know, network. And yes, you know, may maybe we should have responded earlier in IEEE, where we did it in the CW, you know, in the MSA, you know. Could you guys uh, comment on the introduction of a 400 gig? Is there any uh, initial suggestion or any trend? Okay, I'm, I'm getting Who's nodding coming? from the front row. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, there was a, a limit to how much we could cover in 25 minutes session. So, uh, yes, obviously w we're looking ahead to the next generation. Um, I think the good news for this community is uh, you, you get to take a breath <laughs> um, because the transition from 40 gig to 100 gig was pretty fast. I think it's going to be longer getting to 400 gig. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. It, that requires some discussion to, to go through all the details. We're, we are being open about what we're going to use. Come to OFC. We're going to be talking more about it there. I have a question. When you guys moved from multi-mode to single mode, uh, what was the power consumption? Because uh, in your experience, was, uh, without giving specific numbers, uh, how, how did the power consumption aspect, what, what did you guys observe? Actually, for the power consumption standpoint, if you look at the multi-mode and the single mode, like you're talking about SR4, I believe, uh, and the CWDM4, they are pretty similar. Uh, it's not that much of improvement in the power consumption. But having said that, uh, when you work uh, in CWDM4, as Catherine mentioned, the flexibility is the distance and the bandwidth. So you are getting more bandwidth and a flexible distance. So in that 
uh, if you look at these two parameters, it is always bandwidth time distance, right? So basically, CWDM4 ha technology has much more ad advantage than uh, your multi-mode uh, uh, SR4. That answers your question? Okay. Any more questions? All right. Well, please help me thank uh, all the speakers.